If you've seen my Seiko Monster video, you might remember me saying this about an important Seiko chronograph. In 1973. I'd love to have one of those. I'd love to have one of those. Well, I am weak and predictable. I intend this video to be the ultimate overview of the significance and quirks of this watch. Let's jump right in. My name is Jan and you're watching the now more accurately named Time Worn channel. I'll keep the historical aspect simple, because the internet is full of extensive videos on that. The name or nickname stems from Colonel William Reed Polk who chose his personal Seiko 6139-6005 to accompany him on the Skylab 4 mission, 84 days in space from November 1973 until February 1974. The Pogue was Seiko's first watch to space, and it was also one of two very first automatic chronographs in space. But wait, one of the first two chronographs? Now, this might be news to you, since most videos on the Pogue recite the whole first automatic chrono in space story. But Philip from the Moonwatch Universe blog, shout out for that kind of investigative work and passion, was able to confirm in 2020 from NASA image repositories that another watch was indeed snuck into space by Pogue's colleague on the same mission, Gerald Carr. While William Pogue had his watch in a leg pocket of his suit, Carr carried his stowaway watch on his ankle onto the shuttle, while wearing the official Omega Speedmaster on his wrist. His stowaway was a Movado Datacron HS360. It gave me goosebumps that these tidbits of orological history are still being discovered. Another story of firsts surrounds this watch, or the model series in general. Considering the race for the first automatic chronograph, the Seiko Caliber 6139, which also powers the Pogue, beat the Swiss competition by several months, considering the actual introduction of serial produced watches into the market. When Seiko's five speed timer watches with said movement came out in 1969. The Swiss competitors are still famously known for having released their official statements and prototypes for their counterparts earlier at the beginning of the year, but they were only able to actually satisfy market demand much later than Seiko in 1969. The 6139 is a column wheel chronograph combined with a vertical coupling, which became a staple of later chronographs for its very smooth and robust start of the time measurement. Not an invention by a Seiko per se, but they certainly reinstated its appeal in the watch world back in 69. Just a few quick facts to throw around at any party, right? <clears throat> now, there are two layers of vintage love in my opinion. You can either just have a Pogue, which was produced by Seiko from 1969 to around 1979, or you could have the true Pogue for extra credit in the vintage watch community. I'll explain how that one compares to mine in a second, but let's focus on the other 6139-600 chronograph color variations first. There were four in total, and up until now, they all were probably called pogues on the internet at some point in time to connect an auction or offering to the famous story. But the Blue Dial version, for example, had a lesser known nickname of its own. It was named the Sever after the French Formula One driver, unfortunately died in a crash in 1973. The other two, the silver and the Japanese domestic market only teal dial, are quite a rare sight to behold though. That's why it's important to know what a true Pogue is, meaning the exact specification that went into space. It's an American version, referenced 6139-6005 with the dial code 6009T. It has only automatic written below the Seiko logo and it features the 70 meters water resist signage at 9 o'clock as well as the 17J or 17 joules. Compared to my version, the 6139-6002 with the 6009R dial, which was produced five years later after the true poke, you can clearly see all the differences. To make things even more complicated, there are also versions with the 70 meter waterproof on the dial, which, if everything is original, would mean that these are even older than the true poke, since the proof dial was only produced from 69 until early 70, and are therefore highly collectible on their own right. And towards the end of 1972, the whole text was being omitted as it is on my own piece. I hope you're still intrigued as I am. So let's continue with the details of this watch, the case and bracelet first. Part of the appeal is that unique stainless steel cushion case with a set of horns on the top and bottom, radially brushed top and polished sides. It is also beveled towards the bottom, rendering it a very comfortable fit to my wrist with its 42mm in diameter, 
measured across 4 and 10 o'clock, and 46.5 mm lug to lug. It is 14.1 mm in height with an original Seiko Harlex mineral crystal on top, which in my case has gathered quite a few scratches. It weighs a total of 111 grams, including the original H-Link bracelet that I have it on, with tapered end links. And the bracelet itself has a lug width of 19 millimeters, but as you can see, it is a little bit wider here at the beginning with 22 millimeters and transitions nicely into the case. And on the other side, it tapers down to 16 millimeters at the fairly simple Seiko clasp here. There were three other bracelet variations. One being the H-Blink bracelet, but with straight end links, as it was found on pokes from 1973 and older. Then there was a Stilux, a rather rare one, and a fourth one, which was only found on the Japanese domestic market variation. The non-screw-down crown on the side is recessed into the case, sometimes with a notch on older versions, and it has a concave top. The non-screw-down crown has a quirk, since it is not locked in place or screwed down. Any touch on it might offset your inner bezel by a bit, something my OCD can barely handle if it happens. But fortunately the recession of the crown guards it more efficiently than I initially thought. I saved one of the best parts about the case for last, the blue and red or Pepsi tachymeter bezel, a fundamental aspect of any Pogue. Aside the dial, the bezel inlay is one of those aspects that is often replaced with aftermarket parts at some point in a Pogue's life. Therefore, if you're looking for a truly original piece, it is necessary to inspect a lot of details quite closely. If you're interested, there's a great article on ways to spot aftermarket parts on vintagewatchadvisors.com, link down below. Which brings me straight to another very important aspect of any Pogue, the dial. The dial color is often referred to as golden, orange or a mustard kind of yellow. I have a different association. To me it's the color of a refreshing pilsner. I love the contrast of that slight sunburst yellow with the Pepsi bezel and an additional splash of tomato red mixed in from the sub minute counter and central chrono seconds hand. The whole design of the watch is quintessentially 70s and one of the ultimate strength of funky Seikos from that era. The hour and minutes hand are broad with a distinctive ridge along the middle. The loom on the hour and minutes hand was tritium and as you can probably guess since it's a watch from the 70s it's not that bright anymore. The same goes for the loom on the hour indices. The inner rotatable bezel is of a lighter shade of yellow since that plastic ring's color tends to fade and you can find various stages of that one on different offerings online. Again with a little warning that this is one of the parts that was often replaced with aftermarket alternatives. The Seiko name and the hour markers are nicely set upon the dial and have their own shine, just like the intricate design of the day and date frame. The day and date wheel is in black and I have a combination of English and the Arabic date, which puts the origins of this version into the corresponding region. The day and date are set rather uniquely with the poke, via either a push with moderate intensity for the date and a more prolonged and more intense push to advance both the date and the day. The little logo atop the minute counter tells another interesting story. It's the logo of Suva Seikosha, the alternative production facility to the Tokyo Daini Seikosha factory. Suva became immensely important for Seiko when their other sides had to be restored due to the devastating effects of World War II. And you might know both sides' logos from King and Grand Seikos of the same era. And about the movement powering it all, since my watch is from 1976, it features the 6139B movement, which was the successor to the initial 6139A movement since 1971. It beats with 21,600 beats per hour, sits on 17 joules, 21 joules for the Japanese domestic market versions, and it provides 45 hours power reserve in its heyday. About the price, an authentic specimen of the 6002 poke one without proof or resist, in very good condition can fetch from 600 up to 750 euros without even a box or papers. As always, some try to push that boundary far beyond towards a four-digit price tag, but that's something to stay away from in my opinion, if it doesn't offer a more complete package or represents a rarer version like the resist proof, Japanese and domestic market only ones, etc. Authenticity is the key here, as mentioned. So please do some research before purchasing. For example, you can do it via the link in the description. So, the Pogue. A few years back, I would have been put off by the sheer combination of colors. Today, I not only found myself intrigued, but fascinated by the whole story behind this watch model. 
offering a vertical clutch pillar wheel chronograph in the 70s and a connection to spaceflight history makes it hug my wrist even more. It's not the easiest to purchase correctly due to the amount of offerings that are somewhat watered down by aftermarket parts. But given the amazing value for money proposition in the vintage watch world, I would deem it to be a very good or even great entry for anyone interested in the vintage watch world. Hope you enjoyed my take on this time-worn classic and see you in the next one.